So it's been really fun to be here. Um, I'm sorry I'm a little under the weather. I'm getting a little less under the weather as time goes on, and by tomorrow I'll be in fit form. Sorry. Um, but um, it's really, as I said, it's really fun to be here, and it's really fun to you know, interact with lots of really vibrant and dynamic graduate students. And it makes me, I'm graduate advisor at our program, and it makes me even more embarrassed that you know, our sullen graduate students keep to themselves. And we say, go out and talk with people. And you know, it's kicking and screaming to get them to do that. But I've really been having a really fun time interacting with a very enthusiastic bunch here. So what I want to do today is to can sort of continue this conservation behavior theme um, and talk about um, work with any predator behavior, social behavior to some extent, of kangaroos and wallabies and how um, I think we might be able to integrate um, ideas and questions about animal behavior with um, conservation biology. And I've chosen to focus mostly on predation with this because predation really can impact your fitness. You know, getting killed is a bad thing. And um, this is sort of interesting in the Australia, and I chose to work in Australia in part because, because um, Australia has the world's um, worst record of recent mammalian extinctions, at least 19 species since European colonization of mammals have gone extinct. Um, and that's somewhat ironic because, and this includes both native marsupials as well as native rodents, but um, that's sort of ironic because these animals evolved in a rich community of, of natural predators, including very large lizards, um, huge eagles, um, terrible marsupial carnivores. Um, about 3,500 or so years ago, dingoes came into the picture, um, and many species survived the introduction of dingoes. Some didn't, but, but many did. Um, but it's really the cats and um, foxes and the origin of cats and foxes that have um, really decimated, um, literally decimated, um, Australian mammalian fauna. Um, I've chosen to use um, sort of the lab rat of Australian mammals. The tamar wallaby is sort of our star in this. And we're going to talk about a number of studies that um, my research group and I did um, while I was based in Australia, looking at um, any predator behavior and stuff with tamar wallabies, and then extending out to other systems as well. And as I talked about yesterday, I think one way that conservation behavior can be um, used, and we should think about employing behavioral knowledge into conservation, is, is ways to increase reintroduction success. Um, most reintroductions fail. Um, this is an ethical issue. This is a population biology issue. This is an issue that if we want to recover populations or replace populations, we have to reduce and lower the failure rate. And one way of doing that might be to reduce predation. When animals uh, are put into the wild after being brought into from captivity or predator-free locations or um, Etc. Many of these animals die quickly. So maybe the goal is to try to um, get them through that little settling period. And uh, by doing so, we can let the nat some natural processes that may or may not have uh, lead to a successful reintroduction or translocation. Now, moving animals from offshore islands, Australia has many offshore islands with some populations on them, whereas mainland populations are extinct, is kind of like moving from the dangerous, from the um, from the uh, safe suburbs back to the dangerous inner city. And when you go from the dangerous inner city to the safe suburbs, you know, how long should you remain fearful? How long should any predator behavior persist? We know from things, from experiments with guppies, that natural selection can eliminate any predator behavioral adaptations quickly um, for sexually selected coloration and other traits. And we see, in, uh, in a comparative sense, we see evidence of both rapid loss and remarkable persistence of any predator behavior under relaxed and modified selection. So a theme of this talk is going to be to sort of explore um, some of these, these processes. So I've combined field work and um, captive work. Um, and the field work, with wallabies at least, was conducted in four locations. So I'm capitalizing on geographic variation in behavior. We worked on Garden Island, which is an island off Western Australia, that each of these locations has um, different sorts of predators that wallabies are exposed to. So Garden Island is an island of snakes. Um, there are, for as long as people have been studying Garden Island or known about Garden Island, there aren't raptors there. There are no terrestrial mammalian predators there. But there are snakes. Now, there are poisonous snakes that freaked us out, which are small and might kill a wallaby by accident. And then there are boa constrictors. And these boas come in two sizes, short and wallaby eating size. And there's no intermediate sizes, which itself is a really interesting thing that people have been studying. But um, these guys have to worry about snakes. I'm OK with the boas. I wasn't, worried. I wasn't OK with the poisonous ones, but whatever. And there are a lot of poisonous ones. 
Titaning is a place in Western Australia. The, the original historical distribution of Tamers was some offshore islands, sort of this part of Western Australia, this part of South Australia, and some more offshore islands. Um, it is extinct um, in South Australia, or just recently extinct in South Australia, but persisted in a number of places in mainland Western Australia, which recently have been recovered by something called Operation Western Shield, widespread fox baiting, 1080 fox baiting, um, killed the foxes, and all these animals came up. Tamers were one of those animals that came up. And Tataning is a place where these wallabies evolved and have lived with um, ferocious um, mammalian predators, eagles, um, lizards, etc., um, snakes, um, you know, so rich history of exposure to predators. Kangaroo Island is one of the few places where humans have gone extinct. Um, when that, uh, the archaeological record suggests when it was isolated about 11,500 years ago, um, people went extinct, no evidence of consistent populations of mammalian predators for um, you know, 11,500 years or 9,500 years or something like that. I'm losing the detail right now. Um, there are, however, um, raptors, wedge-tailed eagles there. Wedge-tailed eagles may offer some risk to tamers. And then 130 years before we started this study, which is about 140 or 50 years ago now, um, the then governor of New Zealand, Governor Gray, decided he wanted some kangaroos and wallabies in his backyard, so he grabbed them from Australia, brought them over to New Zealand. New Zealand, of course, is an is a island archipelago with uh, some bats that seem to be losing their ability to fly, and, you know, but basically it's birds and very few mammals, and then Kiori, the rat, and that's about it. Um, so this was an introduction to New Zealand where these animals lived a predator-free lifestyle for about 130 years. So can, I want to capitalize on this to try to understand something about the time course of relaxed selection and how different anti-predator behavioral traits change under relaxed or modified selection. Um, at the outset, I'm going to say at some, at some level this is an anecdote. It's four populations. Um, Sticklebacks are a much better system to study this. You have repeated evolutionary isolations, um, uh, and people are studying this in sticklebacks. And some of these ideas that I'm proposing today are being tested with sticklebacks at both the genomic and population level. So I think use this as sort of a stimulus, and maybe it's not as definitive as we might like it to be. So I'm going to talk about group size effects, which I'm going to talk about, kinship and social behavior, differential effects of relaxed selection, predator recognition, and some modeling to study relaxed selection. So put on your seat belts, and here we go. Um, we know that many species, um, uh, while foraging, expose themselves to some risk of predation because they can't be doing two things at one time. And in many cases, species aggregate because by aggregating, they reduce the risk of predation while foraging because either the, they dilute predation risk, they have more eyes around, Three models of predation hazard assessment predict nonlinear declines in predation risk as a function of increased group size. I live in LA, I surf, I teach my students this, and when I teach my students this, I basically say, um, if you're surfing alone, you have some probability of being eaten by a shark. You have a greater probability of being stung by a bee and dying going to the beach, but you have some probability of being eaten by a shark. If you surf with one other person, you've, and make the convenient assumption that the shark's gonna kill one of you, half your probability, two of you, you know, third, et cetera. So nonlinear decline in predation risk. If animals translate that nonlinear decline in predation risk, perceived predation risk or real predation risk, to how they allocate time to behaviors, um, we expect maybe the proportion of time allocated to any predator vigilance to decrease in a nonlinear way. We studied group size effects in captivity because a lot of things can influence group size effects. This was my first study with captive animals. It was kind of fun. And, you know, if you have the experimental control of captivity, you might as well be very anal, so we are very anal. We experimentally controlled for group size. We ramped up and ramped down the population size. Age, we looked at adults, females. Um, we fixed the distribution of food. We fixed the distribution of color. And then we tested for everything we couldn't um, experimentally control for, reproductive status. If you're a female marsupial, you're more or less pregnant your whole life um, and have a joey of some size on board. So we sort of looked at those effects, no effects. Kinship. We looked at microsatellites, calculate coefficient relationship between individuals and groups, and, and, and look for vigilance being influenced by kinship. Dominant status for tamers, it doesn't influence dominance. We could um, look at displacements and the occasional jab um, and calculate dominance hierarchies. For tamers, it's not important. And the location of conspecifics. All of these things could influence how wary you are and how much time you forage and how much time you allocate to other behaviors as a function of changes in group size. We put cat, uh, cat collars on the animals, put keychains on the cat collars, put reflective tape on the keychains, and could look at animals both 
um, you know, at night with image intensifiers and, and, and during the day is sort of dawn and dusk and then and into the night. I'm going to show a lot of graphs that look something like this. Um, on the x-axis is group size. On the y-axis is either proportion of time or percent time engaged in different activities. Um, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm sh illustrating in, in, in thick red lines the um, relationship that better explained variation um, account explained by group size in time allocation to these various behaviors. I fitted logarithmic models and I fitted linear models. The model, my model selection criteria was what explained more variation. In some cases they're very close, but nonetheless, what explained more variation. And if um, variation in perceived predation risk, these were tamaras from Kangaroo Island, if variation studied in captivity, some were captive born, many were wild caught. If variation in perceived predation risk influenced group size in a nonlinear way, I would like to conclude that um, these behaviors are sensitive to variation in predation risk. So, foraging was, looking was, locomotion was, and affiliative behavior was. My career best um, regression, 96% uh, of the variation adjusted R squared, was explained by group size for aggression, um, is a linear relationship, as was self-grooming. Either, you know, when you got a scratch, you got a scratch, or when you're around others, you got to scratch more because of either more parasites, unlikely, or, you know, more need to displace. So, I would suggest that aggression and self-grooming are not sensitive to variation and predation risk while these other behaviors are. Now, why am I talking about group size effects? Because when wallabies are translocated in Australia, the typical historical method was um, to put them in the back of, put them in a hessian sack, a burlap sack, throw them in the back of your ute, your flatbed truck, drive along and plant them in the, in the habitat. And that's fine, except a lot of these translocations failed. And why did they fail? Well, if you talk to many Australian mammalogists, they say, but tamers aren't social. Well, what tamers do is they spend their days um, in the dense cover, um, crouching down, probably holding onto their tail. Um, and then at night, they hop out and they forage in large aggregations. So they certainly forage in large aggregations. They you know, know how to interact with others. They um, displace each other. They do other sorts of social things. So maybe tamers are social. And maybe if animals are social, and this shows that there's evolved responses to being social, then maybe we should introduce them socially. Maybe that would may increase translocation or reintroduction success. So as I said yesterday, I believe that all of these um, lead to adaptive management experiments. We actually had a lot of money organized to, um, uh, the South Australian government wanted to bring animals back from New Zealand to um, South Australia to recover this extinct population in South Australia because they had initially come from South Australia. And they got a lot of money. I got a lot of money. We, together we got a lot of money. We had all these experiments planned. And Australian quarantine wouldn't let us bring them in the country. And while it took them about four years to negotiate this, we had to give money back um, because we weren't spending it. So, and then other things happened, and we were never able to do the adaptive management experiments that we planned, which is unfortunate. So unfortunately, once again, I'm talking about the possible, but not the actual. And many of these things I'm going to talk about today really remain to be tested. But again, this is to provide you know, fruit um, for possible harvesting later. OK, tamers, I'm assuming, are uh, a model macropoded. Um, they're about you know, cat size. They're the smallest of the macropus. Um, uh, uh, genus, Macropus includes the big kangaroos. But whenever you're sort of hand-waving about a model system, you want to know if your model system is a model system, whether um, insights from your model system apply to other species. So we wanted to know whether yellow-footed rock wallabies show similar group size effects. Yellow-footed rock wallabies are a little different. A lot of this cap, all the captive work, most of the captive work was done at the Macquarie University Fauna Park. And we had a captive breeding population of yellow-footed rock wallabies, which are a really attractive wallaby, a little bigger, endangered. And I couldn't manipulate group size experimentally, but we could look at them in different size groups and when they were in different aggregations and try to um, correlate changes in sort of aggregation structure with, with um, time allocation. But what's a group? How do you quantify a group? I study social behavior. I don't even know what a marmot group is. I mean, um, I define, it's taken me a while to get comfortable with this, but I define a marmot group differently for every question I'm asking because sociality involves a series of attributes and you have to sort of nail the attribute you're interested in if you want to then study it. So 
It's taken me a while to be comfortable with different definitions, but I think as long as you're clear about those definitions, that might be okay. So if you go to the literature, which is always a good thing to do, you find in macropoded marsupials, people talk about groups of um, kangaroos or wallabies as the number of individuals then 10 meters, or 30 meters, or 50 meters. Which one? Why don't we ask the wallabies? Um, they don't talk much, but you know, we can ask them other ways. We have ways of making them tell us what's going on. And, and I suggest that we can, um, what, what we did was we looked at the, a focal individual, and while, when we did our focal, we sort of said, how many individuals are within a five meter annulus? How many individuals are within a 10 meter? How many individuals are within a 15 meter? How many individuals are within a 20 meter? That was about as big as we could do in captivity. And we then regressed these def different definitions of group size against time allocation and said, well, if we're going to find relationships, maybe the relationship that explains the most variation tells us something about how the wallabies themselves perceived group size. Okay? Um, aggression was rare, um, but, you know, we noted the outcome of all aggressive displacements and the occasional punch and used these data to calculate a dominance hierarchy. What we found was it seems that yellowfoots are most interested in the number of conspecifics within 10 meters. Um, that was the definition of group size that explained more variation than any other definition. Importantly, we found strong linear relationships. Linear regression models explain more variation than nonlinear regression models, suggesting that um, maybe it's something other than simply variation in perceived predation risk that's important. Now, if you use the argument that um, aggression in, 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 in uh, Tamers um, was a linear relationship. Maybe there's something going on with aggression here. Let's, let's go look a little more. We found that high-ranking wallabies foraged more and looked less than low-ranking ones. Rank had its privileges. We did not find this in, in Tamers. So I would like to sort of suggest, and I, I really need to sit down and find someone to help me model this and write some equations, but um, you know, that, that, that yellowfoots trade off these beneficial group size effects with maybe the effects of increased competition. That um, when we see these linear relationships, maybe what we're seeing is the effects of the, the species, that individuals within a species don't like each other as much. That grouping isn't necessarily as advantageous as when we find these nonlinear relationships. And that's why we might see those. And we actually went out and studied a bunch of different species of rock wallabies in the wild. And in the wild, we either found no group size effects or we found linear group size effects. We never found nonlinear group size effects. Rock wallabies are very different than tamar wallabies. Rock wallabies defend space. And this space, rocky outcrops, are essential, particularly for yellow-footed rock wallabies, which live in the desert. They're essential to have shade from, so they don't dry up. And they're essential to be high enough and safe from predators. And they defend these. So for animals that really have a valued resource that they defend, maybe aggregation isn't as beneficial for animals that just sort of forage on a lot of grass. And maybe yellow-footed rock wallabies wouldn't, inter wouldn't benefit by being introduced socially, whereas tamar-like animals would be, would benefit. Testable hypothesis. So group size effects may be influenced by natural history. And knowing something about the natural history of the animal you're studying might help you figure out whether or not um, introducing animals socially might make a difference. Now, Deb Shire's work with um, black-tailed prairie dogs has demonstrated that introducing animals socially makes a big difference. So um, for social animals, we really should be thinking about social translocations. Ironically, because Australia is really a, a great place with a lot of really great behavioral ecology, particularly avian behavioral ecology, particularly looking at all sorts of complex you know, kin selection stuff going on, Australian mammalogists really have, have focused on the mother-offspring relationship in macropodids and haven't looked for other sorts of um, complex social relationships or social effects. And this is probably because it's just so obvious that there's such a mother-offspring relationship. Um, deciding whether my son is a sea otter or a joey because, you know, he's always attached to my wife. But, um, you know, the joey's in the pouch for nine months. Um, the joey's then at foot for a different, different amounts of time, continuing to, to nurse. And, and people have looked at this mother, mob, obvious mother-offspring relationship. But is there evidence of um, non-offspring kin discrimination or recognition? When we think about designing translocations and reintroductions, we often think about the genetics of it. We want to introduce animals that are going to lead to a large genetic effect of population size. 
But if aggression is costly, and it may be, if you're in a fight, you're not paying attention to what predators are around, and if you suddenly are with a whole bunch of new animals you never knew before and you're put out into the wild, you might be fighting them rather than looking around, um, pred you know, predation could be enhanced by not getting along with others. What we found was that kinship, we created experimentally groups of relatives and non-relatives, and these were based on microsatellites. So our low kinship group um, had coefficients of relationship averaging zero, and our high kinship group had coefficients of relationship, I think, averaging 0.25. Um, that, that when, and this is a within subjects design, that when paired with a non-relative, individuals systematically increased the rates of aggression. Now, again, aggressive interactions per hour, not that big in this particular system, and, and not that intense interactions. These animals weren't hurting themselves, thank God. I mean, we would have stopped the experiment, with, were they? But they weren't. But the effect size of this, 0.589, is pretty big. So we should think that when we're trying to think about how we might want to introduce Tamar, say, that we might want to think about genetics, of course, but we also might want to think about the composition and, not, and put in animals that are relatives. What about familiarity? Familiarity is a common mechanism of kin discrimination in many species. When we factored in familiarity, so these animals were either born in captivity or many of them were wild caught, but since the day they came into the Macquarie University Fauna Park, they'd been moved around different yards um, over time, and we could track who they were housed with, and we could count the number of days that they had exposure to other individuals. And when we factored that out statistically, this effect was even more pronounced. So there is some ability for um, non-familiarity-based kin discrimination in macropoded marsupials, and potentially it could be explored experimentally to see if it influences introduction success. How long do you re retain your fear? How long do you, um, should any predator behavior persist under relaxed or modified selection when you come in um, from a, a dangerous place? There's a lot of variation in, in this, um, and we don't really have good reasons to um, sort of understand this. But for conservation biologists who are interested in moving animals from safe predator-free areas, which may be you know, a captive breeding facility where animals were rescued from the wild and bred up for a couple of generations and then put back into the wild, um, understanding how long any hardwired any predator behavior persists and understanding the developmental nature of any predator behavior are important questions because we don't want to literally throw animals to the wolves. So, um, and if hardwired any predator behavior is lost, then it may be possible to recover that. So developing models to help us understand this process may be really useful. So I'm formally interested in both geographic variation any predator behavior and understanding the time course of relaxed selection for any predator behavior. So our first study looked at western gray kangaroos, about my size, tamar wallabies, you know, about cat sized, at two locations where they both lived. Remember, it's Taning Nature Reserve, Western Australia, had um, a lot of predators, but a lot of mammalian predators. Um, Kangaroo Island, no mammalian predators for the last 9,500 years, um, but large raptors. Now, wedge-tailed eagles have been reported and photographed killing kangaroos. This is rare. Um, kangaroos are big. Um, tamers, however, are much are well within the size of, of wedge-tailed eagle, um, you know, predation. Now. Tamers, again, these animals shelter by day in dense cover and come out to night, at night around dusk to forage. And so there's some overlap where they might be vulnerable. And again, in the morning when they're going back in, they might be vulnerable to wedge-tailed eagle predation. I think, and we can discuss this later on, that um, group size effects and things like, well, group size effects um, are probably a pretty efficient anti-predator adaptation um, against mammalian predators at least two of the mechanisms. Um, detection type models um, assume that if you have more eyes, you can detect things sooner. And you can escape a mammalian predator, or you have a chance of escaping a mammalian predator if you've got more eyes or noses to detect things. Dilution models, um, it's sort of agnostic. I mean, just having more animals there um, will, um, will, will reduce the risk. But um, eagle predation is sort of like a lightning bolt. Snake predation is like stepping on a landmine. Um, eagle predation is like a lightning bolt, and maybe you can do something if you can detect a mammalian predator sooner. So I'd like to suggest that let's just sort of assume for a moment that, um, that, that group size effects are an effective anti-mammalian predator adaptation and might not be as effective for, um, for, for raptor predation. 
Um, so no mammalian predators for the past 9,500 years, which on Kangaroo Island, which means no predation risk for kangaroos, but some predation risk from the eagles for wallabies. We're going to look at group size effects, trade-offs between foraging and vigilance, the distribution of behavior in space, where they're doing things, and for wallabies at least, how close we could get to them, flush distance, flight initiation distance. Couldn't do this for kangaroos. Um, so this is wild data, and what we're looking at here is we're looking at tamar wallabies on the left, and we're looking at um, western gray kangaroos on the right. We're looking at Kangaroo Island. We're looking at Tatanning, Kangaroo Island, Tatanning. And I'm illustrating um, the regression that better fit, better explain the data, linear or nonlinear. And there's a lot of other junk in here because we didn't know how to quantify group size for kangaroos or really wallabies in the wild. So we counted the number of conspecifics within 10 meters and, and 50 meters, which kind of was hard to do at night for the wallabies. But um, most of this, these were done um, after dark with image intensifiers. Um, and what we found was strong linear effects at Tatanning for the kangaroos, um, and um, no uh, effects, group size effects, at Kangaroo Island, the safe place. And um, we found that, in this case, the number of conspecifics within 50 meters explained more variation than within 10. Later on, I went and studied other species. And basically, little species are sensitive to the number of conspecifics within 10 meters. Medium-sized species, maybe 30 meters. And big species, maybe 50 meters, which makes sense. Um, so loss of any predator behavior, potentially, <coughs> on Kangaroo Island. Wallabies kept their any predator behavior. No mammalian predators, but they still have group size effects. OK? Um, what about some of these other things? Trade-offs between foraging and looking are pretty plastic. We know that. Um, but both species at the risky Tatanning site um, were more vigilant when they were out foraging. And most species forage more when they were out foraging and were less vigilant at the less risky Tatanning site. Where did they forage? Distance to cover. Um, a lot of variation between sites. Um, but interestingly, where they were at the risky site, how far they were from cover at the risky site, seems to be somewhat revealing. So at Tatanning, the dangerous place, wallabies were closer to cover than at the safe place. At um, whereas kangaroos were farther from cover at the dangerous place than the safe place. When we watch these guys, um, tamers are basically trying to steal second base. They, you know, they, they run out, and if they get scared, they run back. And if they, they run out, and they run back if they get scared. And, and, and the cover was, I infer, is protective for tamers. By contrast, for kangaroos, cover seems to be obstructive. They'd come out, particularly at Tatanning, this was really obvious. Um, they'd come out, they'd look around, and they'd skip to the center of the meadows, get up and look around. Um, for a big kangaroo, um, they can detect threats coming from a distance if they can see them. So cover may, in fact, be obstructive. So um, space use is plastic, but maybe how cover is perceived is a little more constrained, maybe. Um, we wanted to walk towards wall uh, kangaroos at to Tanning, but I mean, they would start skipping away at about 300 meters or so. And as soon as I saw them, they'd skip away. So we couldn't really get a good data set on this. But for, for Kangaroo Island um, tamers, we could just sort of walk up to them. Um, sealers, European people, seal hunters, when they hit Kangaroo Island, um, basically went up to kangaroos and wallabies and clubbed them on the heads and had fresh meat. So um, these animals are sort of accustomed or, or naive or, or not worried about things. Whereas at Tatanning, we couldn't get that close to to wallabies. OK, so flight initiation distance is quite plastic. I'd like to suggest that any predator behavior continuum or varies along a continuum of plasticity, whereas some things are very plastic, um, maybe experience dependent, whereas other things become more constrained. OK, um, group size effects appear to be more constrained. So what might explain this constraint? Um, why is? Um, any predator behavior constrained? Why might group size effects persist in tamers? Now, there are a couple of hypotheses for this constraint. I'm not going to go into these in detail, but one of them is the ghosts of predators past hypothesis, which really is a descriptive hypothesis that says any predator behavior will be retained if it's not too costly. There's a pleiotropic hypothesis that says any predator behavioral traits have pleiotropic effects and they're going to persist despite the absence of predators. There's a functional integration hypothesis, which um, sort of emphasizes the fact that any predator behaviors um, 
the motor patterns themselves may be useful in other contexts. So um, if you're vigilant for predators, you also might have to be vigilant for conspecifics or to look for food. <coughs> so because vigilance is going to be sort of maintained by other reasons, um, <coughs> it's not going to entirely disappear with, when, um, when predators are lost. And there's this also idea out there that complex behavior may be resistant to change because mutations are more likely to be less favorable in a complex organism than a simple one. So <coughs> I sort of wanted to take these ideas and integrate them and draw from them and try to come up with a more, some more concrete and articulated predictions. And I came up with something I call the multi-predator hypothesis, which basically says that the presence of a single predator will maintain pleiotropic or otherwise linked or integrated any predator behavior. And in some, in some ways, we expect any predator behavior, um, like other complex behaviors and systems, to maybe be linked. And maybe we even expect traits to be on the same chromosomes, because we wouldn't want crossing over to um, get rid of uh, two traits of interest. We might also expect the various traits to be fixed, which doesn't imply, imply linkage per se, but um, there is variation in many of these things. So imagine a pronghorn, a baby pronghorn. It's got to be immobile, and it's got to um, be cryptic. So if it had, was not cryptic and it was immobile, maybe predators would see it more. If it was very cryptic, but it bounced around like it had a brainworm, it probably wouldn't last too long. So crypsis and immobility, if there's going to be a genetic um, you know, uh, control of that in any way, we might not expect those traits to be assorting independently. Similarly, being the best little pronghorn to avoid, uh, well, being the best of another animal, let's not use pronghorn for this, to avoid foxes, um, but being really horrible at dealing with eagles, if you're preyed upon by both foxes and eagles, wouldn't be so good either. So we might expect um, syndromes of anti-predator behavioral traits, and we might expect those to co-evolve, and there are predictions from the multi-predator hypothesis that hopefully will be tested in stickleback that will tell us where these traits actually are. So we expect these any predator behaviors to be linked and for selection to maintain these linkages if there's any benefit from doing so. In other words, as long as there's some predators. You could lose the eagles, but as long as there's foxes, we might still have any predator behavior for eagles. So that's sort of a prediction that we can test with the tamers. And the prediction is that animals living with some predators will maintain any predator behavior, while those living without predators will lose it. Remember New Zealand? Governor Gray and his uh, little wallabies in his backyard? 130 years of predator-free living? What happens? They don't have group size effects. So when we look at these populations of tamers with predators, Garden Island, they have snakes, landmines. Tatani, they've got everything, genuine fear. Kangaroo Island, they have lightning bolts. Um, group size effects. New Zealand, they have kiwis, no group size effects. Kind of cool. Um, other support for the multi-predator hypothesis is that I'm going to talk about predator recognition in a moment. Um, and I'm going to talk about results from kangaroo island animals that we studied in captivity. But we also went to New Zealand and <coughs> borrowed some animals and looked at predator discrimination recognition abilities there, and they don't really discriminate, suggesting that discrimination abilities break down quickly. And um, I'm going to show you that kangaroo island animals even are able to distinguish novel terrestrial mammalian predators, even though they haven't had them for 9,500 years. And that, as we showed before, western gray kangaroos have group size effects at the mainland Tatanning site, but not on kangaroo island. Well, there are no kangaroo predators on kangaroo island. So maybe there's something going on there. So let's. Let's look at predator recognition abilities, and let's um, uh, ask what um, kangaroo island tamers know about predators. Let's give them a standardized intelligence test. And we're going to play with our feral cat here and a fox. Both of these are novel mammalian predators. We um, tried to find a thylacine skin, but we couldn't, so we made Tony the tiger. Kind of ugly. His head kept falling off, but <laughs> we persevered. Um, we have a. Uh, stuffed wallaby in Australian English, stuffed means something a little different, as in your stuffed mate. Um, so that was one of our controls. We had another control where we had the cart that all of these things was going to roll on and you know, make some noise. And then we had another control, got to be anal if you're doing captive experiments, where we had a blank, no treatment con control where we looked for spontaneous change in behavior. 
So we trained animals up to get used to being in a, isolated in a yard for a couple of days, habituated them to that. And then we had um, tracks um, on either side of the cage and a window, a little stage, and something would happen um, when the animal was baited to eat. Um, Kangaroo island tamers. Lots of species respond to the sounds of their predators. Wise prey responds to the sounds of their predators. Dingoes, <laughs> evolutionary novel predator. Wedge-tailed eagle, a control because we played these back from near the ground. Wedge-tails sometimes sing from the, I'm sorry, wedge-tailed eagles, an evolutionarily salient predator um, for kang ta kangaroo island tamers. Magpies, a uh, control that we played these from around the ground and uh, magpies often sing from the ground and onto genetically these animals certainly knew what magpies were. And foot thumps. All kangaroos and wallabies except tree kangaroos thump their feet in alarm. Um, you can imagine a tree kangaroo trying to thump its feet and maybe you see why they don't thump their feet. And I actually went to Australia really jazzed about taking some of my um, armamentaria of, of marmot scaring toys and skills and trying to understand alarm thumping and the function of alarm thumping. Um, and these guys and I went with geophones and I um, went with all sorts of ideas about how I could walk towards them and get them to thump because when I was there before I'd heard marmot or wallabies thumping when I walked towards them. And then when I went out into the, into the dark uh, at Kangaroo Island, I realized that as I would walk towards an animal with my image intensifier, you know, seeing it and, and counting paces and seeing how close I could get before it would thump, it wouldn't thump. But I would hear thousands of thumps around me. So I was eliciting thumps, but I wasn't eliciting thumps from a known individual where I could, you know, measure things. So that, that sort of failed. But thumbs could be directed to conspecifics or they could be directed to the predator. And this is essentially a playback to test for conspecific. And we also had a blank control. We befriended people at the Taronga Zoo and got all sorts of turds of various animals, um, predators and non-predators, um, to ask about olfactory predator discrimination. Many species respond to the smells of their predators, not usually nicely, and they get scared by them. Um, and we wanted to know about whether tamers could. So I mean, what do they know about predators? This is a prototypical exemplar of a tamar investigating a wallaby. So the wallaby has just appeared over here on the left um, on the stage. And this, this tamar over here has just sort of hopped up and uh, has walked towards it, has locomoted up to it, is sort of looking at it. You look pretty stuffed, mate. You know, sort of <laughs> pentapedally walks away, looks back. Still stuffed, mate. You can see a little plate where there's some food in the center of the yard where we baited the thing in to begin with. That's very different from how they respond to foxes. There's the fox, there's the wallaby, hops away, foot thumps, throws out its arms in, a, in something that clearly has signal value, gets to the back of the cage and glares at me. <laughs> what are you doing to me? This is not environmental enrichment. Okay, so Look at that quantitatively within subjects design, means 95% confidence intervals, looking at differences from baseline behavior. Tamers increase vigilance, foot thumped, and suppressed foraging in response to the sight of novel predators. Foot thumping is a predator elicited signal, and for foxes, you know, really big foot thumping response. These guys hadn't been exposed to terrestrial mammalian predators for 9,500 years. If anything, they'd been exposed to some cats in the Macquarie University yards, which would climb the fences. But, you know, they don't know foxes, really. Um, and, you know, there's some response to cats, but, but not as much to, as to foxes. Um, we see that there's a response to the wallaby, but we saw that that's sort of an investigative response. They stop foraging and go up to it and say, are you OK? Maybe not. Um, what about sounds? Tamers look more and forage less after playback of foot thumps. Don't seem to discriminate the sounds of um, predators. But this is the first demonstration that, that foot thumps have a conspecific alarming function. They could still be directed to the predator, but they have a conspecific alarming function. Why do they respond to the sight but not sound of predators? Well, if you're going to kill things and chase them down, you're probably going to have some long legs. You're probably going to have ears to hear them. You're going to have a big mouth so you can immobilize that thing. And there's strong convergence for morphology among predators. By contrast, for acoustic stimuli, there's a lot of divergence. I mean, these aren't animals that are out singing, I'm going to go kill a wallaby now, but they're, they're out you know, communicating to each other. They're, they're out engaged in social communication. Um, you know, we know that um, species have to find their own species and communicate with their own species, so there's strong selection for divergent vocalization. So maybe this is something that has to be learned, and maybe this is why we don't see um, convergence. We don't, by the way, we don't know the cue that um, the wallabies were cluing on that allowed them to respond to um, foxes, 
But we know it wasn't novelty per se, because in another series of experiments, Andrea Griffin um, exposed them to goats. They don't respond to goats. And importantly, you can train a tamer to be more agitated about the sight of a fox, but you can't train it to be more agitated about the sight of a goat. So they've got a template. And I think that in New Zealand, this template was breaking down, which explains why there was sort of no discrimination in New Zealand. Um, we did a lot of these experiments. And the, the olfactory test was um, two feeders, a slurry of poop, um, smelled very different to us. Herbivore crap smells good or not as aversive. Carnivore crap smells disgusting. Um, <clears throat> and any way we looked at it, there just wasn't anything going on here. Um, if anything, if anything, I mean, have anyone, has anyone smelled elephant shit? I mean, it smells really good. I mean, elephants eat a lot of stuff, and it just comes right out. And if anything, it smells sort of grassier and greenier. So when we rehydrated that, it smelled really good. Um, and if anything, they foraged more next to elephant shit, <laughs> if anything. Um, but in general, tamar tam foraging wasn't affected by the scent of predators. We, we uh, said, OK, well, maybe it's not feces. Maybe it's something else. We couldn't get a whole bunch of scent glands. But um, nonetheless, we, we said, well, what about urine? And there's a wonderful literature out there called the repellent literature. And in the repellent literature, people talk about area repellents and contact repellents. So basically, we, we first um, went to a vet and got a bunch of dog urine that they got expressed from bladders when they were doing surgery or something. And then we went to the, uh, a friendly, well-trained vegan and asked him to urinate a lot. And we got his urine. And uh, these two smelled different. And um, you know, put those out in little vials next to the food and nothing. Um, and then, because that's an area repellent, so there is no area repellent effect. And then we said, OK, um, let's do the contact repellent. And if anything, the take home from this is wallabies don't like you peeing on their Wheaties because they wouldn't sort of forage on those and the wallaby food when it had urine on it. OK, so tamar foraging isn't affected by the center predators. We said, OK, tamars, maybe tamars are dumb. What's going on here? We had a captive um, reared predator naive population of redneck patty melons, really cute little macropoded marsupial, similar results. Um, we hit the literature because I said, look, I've seen studies where people have found evidence of this. You know, and if you look at the literature and sort of say, well, what's going on? I made a big table. Um, what's going on is, well, those were studies that either in the wild were done in the wild, where there were some exposure to natural predators, or in captivity, where the, either they experimentally or naturally had predators in the yards. They found evidence of olfactory predator recognition in marsupials, suggesting to me that um, for marsupial herbivores, maybe olfactory predator recognition is something that has to be learned. Maybe they're primed to learn it, but there was no evidence from that in our tamar wallabies. A lot of animals um, forage more and uh, are less vigilant on dark nights. So when you're designing a reintroduction, do you do it on moonlit nights or moon-free nights? Or when do you do it in the month, if you've got a choice? And if you read the sort of small mammal literature, um, animals seem to feel more comfortable when it's very dark. What about tamers? We designed a factorial experiment, four groups, six adult females in each group, three moon phase treatments. It was Sydney. It was a wet year. Um, there were a lot of clouds. There were trees in our yards. It was pretty dark there, you know, even when there was a moon on some of these nights. So we said, let's, in addition to the natural moon phase treatment, add an artificial light treatment. Four watt you know, flashlight, basically, um, uh, white, or it had red filter or no lights. And then we would look at these in the middle of the night with inten image intensifiers. This is really embarrassing. So I don't think you should tell anybody this. But tamers are afraid of the dark. Um, they foraged more and were less vigilant on nights with light. In retrospect, although not initially, this made a lot of sense because we know that they're using their eyes to detect predators and discriminate among predators. So maybe, if you have a choice, um, maybe you could have an illumination treatment when you release them if you're doing a soft release or even a hard release where they can hang out in an area with light. Or maybe you could do it on moonlit nights and not release them you know, in, in, in the dark, on dark nights. Things that could be studied. Finally, I want to talk briefly about um, a simulation environment to study relaxed selection. Um, I was lecturing in an animats class, a, in a computer science class, um, where people were developing sort of animats, autonomous agent models. 
And I got some students interested in, in, in coming up with a, in a project to sort of try to create a simulation environment that would study relaxed and modified selection. And um, we ended up working for like two years together and getting a paper out of it. And, and, and the paper is somewhat inconclusive, but let me tell you the process because it's kind of a fun idea. Um, we, we basically used a neural network. So neural network, neural network models are models that assume there are some sensory neurons, and then there's some inner neurons, and then there's some decisions that are made. And neural networks are algorithms that are really good classification <coughs> algorithms that can classify or discriminate among different things once you train them up. And the process of training them up is starting with connections between everything with equal weights, and then in a computationally intensive way, prune out those connections um, and change weights that, until um, you can discriminate two things. So we trained up a neural network to discriminate between an aerial predator and an aerial non-predator, and a terrestrial predator and a terrestrial non-predator. So that was our first thing. And then we did what I call a Lamarckian transformation. We encoded these weighting levels and these connections into a genome. Boom. Learning, genome. And we said, let's put this genome in an autonomous agent, an animat. And this animat had to go around and avoid getting killed, and it had to eat. So it would starve if it stayed in cover the whole time. So if it ran from everything, it would starve. And if it um, kept trying to eat, it would get killed if there were predators around, although not if there weren't predators around. And then we used a genetic algorithm to track evolution over time, track the um, predator discrimination abilities over time. And it looks sort of like a video game, which the initial idea was. It didn't really work out. The little black things are the, the predators, and the little yellow things are the wallabies, and the little spots there are, are, are the food they're trying to eat. And where it says nest, that's really cover. We called it, um, we called these wallamats and Wally World. And if, if the whole thing was a little easier to use, we initially were designing it to be sort of a teaching tool, but that never worked out. In any event, what are the lessons from the animats? And, and some of them make a lot of sense in retrospect and, and suggest things that are important for, um, for thinking about relaxed selection. And, and one of these is mutation rate has the single largest effect on the persistence of predator discrimination abilities. So when we removed predators selectively um, and, and looked for how long discrimination abilities would persist, we found that mutation rate, we ran this as an ANOVA, but we, um, we found that mutation rate had the largest effect size. Now, at some level, that makes sense. You know, if you have too much mutation, you break apart everything you have. But mutation certainly is under control. There are mutation repair mechanisms. There are areas in the world that have higher mutation rates. There are species that have higher mutation rates. So mutation itself is something that is selected in some, at some level. Um, so mutations are important in mutation rates. The cost of escape was very important, too. If it was very energy, energetically expensive to escape, there was a direct main effect, a pretty moderate effect size, on explaining how long predator discrimination abilities would persist. Remarkably, the presence of aerial or terrestrial predators has a very modest effect, and this effect was asymmetrical. Terrestrial predator recognition was influenced by the persistence of terrestrial, but not aerial predators. Aerial predator recognition wasn't influenced by the loss of either terrestrial or aerial predators. And on a good day, I can wrap my head around that result and sort of somehow explain you know, how that's sort of consistent with the multi-predator hypothesis. And it sort of is, but it's, it's, it's not a clean test of it. It's not a clean demonstration that we created a simulation environment that captured the right um, attributes that would allow us to study this in detail. But it's a, it's a first stab at that. So um, with that somewhat frustrating model result, I'd like to wrap up and say that any predator behavior may be retained following long periods of relaxed selection. Natural history may influence the benefits of aggregation. Um, and knowledge of any predator behavioral abilities may have important implications for the design and trans and or of design of translocations or reintroductions. We would like to um, do experiments where we might introduce kin, socially or not, on full moon nights or not, and from populations with some history of predation or not, to see if and how these have effects on ultimate survival. And with that, I'd like to thank you again for listening to me, and I'd be delighted to try to answer some questions. <laughs>
naturally? Yeah. I mean, do they, do they have different strategies for liking wolves versus... I don't know, because I never really saw wallabies respond to raptors in the field. I mean, every once in a while they'd fly over, but yeah. I didn't really see good interactions that I'd be comfortable saying what happened. I mean, I see that with marmots, but I didn't really see it with wallabies. Um, they may indeed, maybe they just run to cover, I don't know. Um, and I've never seen them respond to natural mammalian predators in the field either, because I was at Tatani, I mean, the natural predators were recently eradicated. Well, even if they have different responses, the hardcore version of the multi-predator hypothesis would predict that even those very different responses would persist. Empirical question. I mean, if you buy the argument of sort of a co-evolved any predator behavioral system, then it doesn't really matter if it's the same motor pattern or the same type of response. So the easy multi-predator hypothesis says, well, well, you know, of course shared um, responses are going to persist. But the hardcore prediction is that maybe not. It doesn't need necessarily need to be shared. It could be unique. Test it. Let me know what you find. Yeah. Um, am I correct? You're sort of, a couple of times you're alluding to the fact that sociality is adaptive, but not preferred. That a lot of these species would rather be less on today, would rather be. I don't, I don't know about these guys. Australians have asserted that they're not social, but it's like they do sort of social things. So kind of said that with marmots, too. I'm, I'm working on the assumption that marmots are badgers, but we'll see. Okay. Other marmots are more social, but the marmots I'm studying might be badgers. So how do you keep apart? I mean, the, when they aggregate, we can um, they can be more isolated because they have different predators. They can It could be a dilution. Not necessarily, uh, you know, an aversion. More you know, they're not averting predation per se. You know, there, there's there's the way an animal moves that can they can avoid actually capture. I guess. Is what I'm okay, so so I, I would say that dilution effects as well. If animals are aggregating in, if variation predation risk leads to variation in aggregation patterns, which it does in some species. Animals are, might aggregate more where, where there's more predation risk. Um, I'd say that's a social behavior, even if the animals aren't that social. Most of the group size effect studies are in studies, <coughs> are in systems um, where they're looking at temporary foraging aggregations. So you have a flock of birds. Um, when I looked at this in golden marmots in Pakistan, I said um, naively, initially, um, you know, well, what about being social? I'm, I'm looking at all these different groups. They're in diff the groups have different sizes. What is the group size effect with respect to living in a group as opposed to being in a foraging aggregation? That explains very little variation, very, very little variation in, in, in time allocation. It's really the dynamic aggregation. I mean, they're looking around to see who's, who's around. And they're, pro they're either cluing on the behavior, escape behavior of others <clears throat> and, and, and benefiting by detection. And this happens in animals that don't necessarily like each other, that are territorial or you know, monogamous. So you don't have to be living in a group where everyone's singing kumbaya to benefit by aggregating. Or other species. Yeah, and then you have mixed species aggregations where animals are trading off and acquiring information and reducing risk as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it kind of does. I just, I, I keep thinking about the behavior, mm -hmm. you know, with, where they actually, you know, they're in an aggregate and they have, you know, they're going to protectability, predator protectability <coughs> numbers, but also they actually use each other to confuse the predator. As one would be when you see zebras. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, but they, they do that, you know, and it's just, um, so, you know, it just seems there's, there's two components that don't get addressed. Yeah. Um, so do, do solitary zebras running away from something do the same movements as two zebras together? I don't want to know that. Because, you know, certainly if you're, because I mean some of these zebras are very cooperative and are in, you know, groups, et cetera, you know, maybe they really are 
cooperating in a, in a, in a fun way. Yeah. Yeah. But not very social animals still may benefit by being in groups, in aggregations, by group size effects, by detection effects, by it's <coughs> maybe not coordinated predation avoidance. Which actually, if you've got coordinated predation avoidance, I mean that's in some sense um, evidence of a coalition that you're cooperating to achieve a goal. And that's something that's a very complex social behavior, which is cool. And there's some evidence of coalitionary anti-predator behavior in some species. Yeah? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really sort of fascinated by the idea of cliotropy and how it sort of, um, I guess, could uh, lead to less erosion or anti-predator behavior uh, over time. Um, and I'm wondering, are, are there genetic tools available now that actually test the hypothesis that pleiotropy um, sort of reduces the, the degradation of anti-predator behavior over time? I'm not a geneticist. Does anyone know? I mean, I, I don't really understand how to. I mean, you can study pleiotropic effects, um, but pleiotropy itself isn't linkage, isn't, you know, so there are genetic tools to look at linkage type things. Um, and I, 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 I don't really know them. Um, in theory, you could test that. Um, you have to map out how things are correlated first. Um, so pleiotropy are just phenotypic correlations as opposed to sort of linkage where you're, I mean, you're inferring this from phenotypic correlations usually. So I'm not sure. But in theory, you, there just must be a way. Does anyone know? been good field studies of the behavioral ecology of tamers in the wild. They're pretty hard to study. People have looked at attributes of things. People have looked at some foraging behavior and put microphones on them to sort of figure out activity patterns and foraging stuff. But there hasn't been a really good behavioral ecological study using the whole toolkit we have now. So go study it. Yeah, okay. I don't think it's an artifact, yeah. but um, well, I, I don't know what's going on. No idea. Uh, no idea. <laughs>